Next up, we have Jeremy Keith. Jeremy Keith is a web developer for ClearLeft, an agency based out of Brighton. And in this talk, he's gonna be discussing the layers of the web and how we as a community can build more resilient technologies for our web applications. Enjoy the session. Hello, Future Sync. Uh, my name is Jeremy, and I would like to talk to you about the web. And I wanna answer a question. I want to find out where the web came from. Now, on the face of it, it's uh, kind of a stupid question because there's an obvious answer. Uh, the web came from this guy, Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee was working at CERN, the European Centre for Nuclear Research, uh, in the 80s, and he wrote this proposal in May of 1989. It was called Information Management, a Proposal, where he outlined his idea for a, a global hypertext system that would come to be known as the World Wide Web. Now, this proposal was kind of unreadable, frankly, and it had incomprehensible diagrams, but his supervisor, Mike Sendall, he saw the potential. He scrawled across the top, vague, but exciting. And Tim Berners-Lee gets the go-ahead and he starts building this idea of a World Wide Web. He builds the very first web browser. He builds the very first a uh, web server, which is uh, on, on this machine, it's um, a Next computer. Uh, this one, uh, the very one that was the world's first web server, can be seen in the Science Museum in London. Uh, and I have I've a real fondness for, for this machine because I was really fortunate last year uh, to be invited to CERN along with a, a group of other nerds um, to take part in a project relating to the, the birth of the web and that initial proposal. Um, I'll play this video which, uh, which explains it. So we came to CERN this week in order to create some sort of modern day interpretation of the very first uh, web browser. So the project is to restore the first browser which was uh, developed by the inventor of the web and the idea is to recreate an experience for the people who could not uh, use the web in its early days to have an idea how it felt to use the web at that time. I think the biggest difficulty was to make uh, the browser work in the in the next machine that we had. We really needed to work with a with an original um, next box in order to really understand what that experience was like, um, in order to be able be able to write some code um, to replicate that experience. So my role is uh, code, so generating the code to create the interactive aspect of the uh, um, the World Wide Web browser, recreated browser. So it's very much writing JavaScript to kind of create all the the next operating system kind of UI, um, making requests to servers to go and get the HTML and and massage the HTML back into a format that looks good in this uh, the World Wide Web browser, um, and making sure that we actually end up with a a URL that goes into production that people can come and visit and and see their own web pages and the, the tangible software uh, is what I'm responsible for so I have to make sure it all gets done uh, otherwise we have no no browser to look at basically we got together a few years back to do a similar sort of hack project here at CERN, which was creating the world's second ever web browser, which was the Line Mode browser. Uh, and we had a lot of fun with it, and it's a great bunch of people from all over the world. So it's been really great to get back together, and it's always amazing to be here at CERN, to be at not just the birthplace of the web, but the most important place on the planet for science. Uh, and yeah, it's just been a lot of fun, and I kind of don't want it to be over because uh, we're, we're in our element, hacking away, having fun, and just soaking up the atmosphere. And we're getting to chat with people who were there 30 years ago, you know, Jean-Francois Croft and Robert Caillou, these people who were involved in the creation of the World Wide Web. But uh, to me, that's amazing to be, you know, 
surrounded by so much uh, World Wide Web history. So the plan is that uh, this will go online and anyone will be able to access it because it's on the web and that's the beautiful thing about the web is that anyone can, can visit a website. And so everyone will have the opportunity to try using the world's first web browser and maybe see what uh, modern web pages would look like if they were passed through this uh, first web browser. Well, uh, spoiler alert, we did succeed and you can indeed go online and look at modern websites uh, in the first web browser, worldwideweb.cern.ch is the URL there. Um, Remy was doing all the real work, right? Making this this all actually behave like the first website. Uh, this is the very first website in the first web browser and it's a perfect recreation. Um, I was more involved in the explanatory website that went with the project. I spent most of my time working on this timeline of, of the web because this was all about um, the 30th anniversary of that initial proposal. I thought, well, it's fairly easy to show what happened in the 30 years since the invention of the web. But what about the 30 years beforehand? What were the, what were the influences feeding into the creation of the World Wide Web? And I gave myself this arbitrary boundary of 30 years so that it would have this nice symmetry with the 30th anniversary. But um, it is an arbitrary boundary. I mean, what if I went further back? What, you know, how far back do I need to go to find out the influences on Tim Berners-Lee? Now, if you were to ask Tim Berners-Lee himself what his influences were, he'd be able to give you a straight answer. He would say his influences were Conway Berners-Lee and Mary Lee Woods. That would be his father and his mother. And okay, everyone says this, right? You know, my parents were this big influence on me. They gave me a loving environment, all that stuff. But in this case, uh, there was a literal influence going on in that both Mary Lee Woods and uh, Conway Berners-Lee worked with computers. It's where they met. They were working on the Ferranti Mark I computer in the 1950s. This is really early on in the history of computing in the, in, in the UK. Um, one of the earliest computers. So you can see there was a direct influence there of computing and programming in the family life of Tim Berners-Lee. But this is an early computer. It's not the first computer. I mean, how far back do I go to try and find, well, what was the first computer ever? Uh, is this the first computer, the Antikythera mechanism? This was recovered from a shipwreck in the 20th century, but it dates back thousands of years. This is now in a museum in, in Athens, and it is a, a computing device. It calculates the positions of stars and planets. Uh, is this the first computer? Maybe. Uh, it's not a programmable computer, though. So where do we look for, for the idea of programmable computing? Well, maybe we look to the 19th century. We look at uh, this gentleman, Charles Babbage. Um, this is Charles Babbage and half of Charles Babbage's brain, which is in the Science Museum in London, along with the original Next Machine that the World Wide Web was, was created on. Uh, the other half of Babbage's brain is in the Computing History Museum in Palo Alto. And Charles Babbage had this idea of creating a a machine for calculations. It was called the Difference Engine. He kind of had a startup that was seed funded by the government to create this Difference Engine, but then he, he kind of stopped halfway through and said, no, no, I've got something better. I'm going to create the Analytical Engine. And uh, that would be like the Difference Engine 2.0. Um, and neither of them really worked. But along the way, there's some you know fascinating parallels to modern computing. You can see that it's almost got this central processing unit and it is doing calculations. And this idea of, of being programmable, we could maybe look to Babbage's collaborator for that. This is Ada Lovelace. And, and she was translating some mathematical presentation given by an Italian mathematician about difference engines and calculations. And she realized, well, wait a minute. If we're doing these operations on, on numbers, but those numbers could stand in for other concepts, then we could do you know, operations on anything. On, on words, on pictures, on concepts, uh, which is a fascinating idea because that is pretty much 
what we do today with computers. I mean, when you are using a word processor, you're not literally processing words, you're manipulating ones and zeros. When you use a graphics program, you're not actually moving any pixels around. What you're doing is under the hood, you're manipulating ones and zeros. So this is, you know, the real spark of the idea of programming. But like I say, the analytical engine never happened. And this did end up becoming something of a, of a dead end because the ideas of Babbage and Lovelace weren't an influence later on. For example, Alan Turing, uh, absolute genius and certainly responsible for kickstarting computing in the century. Uh, he was not aware of the work of, of Babbage and Lovelace when he was coming up with his concepts of the, the, the idea of a universal machine, a Turing machine. They had given, you know, a long enough strip of tape um, and enough time you could calculate just about anything, right? Which is pretty much what modern computing is. Um, a lot of parallels to what Babbage and Lovelace were thinking about, but Turing was not aware of their work. Now, Turing, he was working at Bletchley Park during the war, uh, working on cracking the, the codes, the German codes on the Enigma machines. Uh, and this was top secret stuff. And his work there led to the creation of Colossus. And I would consider Colossus to be the world's first programmable computer. Now, uh, because the work of Bletchley Park was so top secret, even to this day, you sometimes see history books that say, no, no, the world's first programmable computer was the ENIAC computer in the, in the States. But I think Colossus deserves to be called the world's first programmable computer, the creation of Tommy Flowers, a colleague of Turing's. And then Flowers and Turing and these, these brilliant mathematicians of Bletchley Park, we, we can't say that they were responsible for, for winning the war necessarily, but they were almost certainly responsible for shortening the war that without the work of Turing and the code breakers of Bletchley Park, the war would not have ended in 1945. And 1945, that's the year of a publication by this man. This is Vannevar Bush, a scientist, a thinker, and he published an article in 1945 in the Atlantic Monthly. The article was called, As We May Think. And in this article, he describes a, a fictional device. He, he describes this, this analog device that's built into a desk and it uses microfilm and it allows the user to pull up information stored on the microfilm, but also to connect ideas, to connect things, different bits of information, to leave associative trails, right? So this is very much like the idea of hypertext before the word hypertext really existed. And this was definitely an influence on Tim Berners-Lee, I'm sure of it. This device that, that Vannevar Bush uh, talked about in this article, he called it the Memex. So this article is published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1945. 1945 is also the year that this young gentleman is drafted into the Navy in America. His name is Douglas Engelbart. And he's drafted into the Navy, he's on the ship leading, leaving San Francisco Harbor when word comes through that the war is over. Now, he's still shipped out to the Pacific, uh, but now instead of fighting against the Japanese, he's sitting in a hut reading magazines. And that's where he reads As We May Think by, by Van Ivar Bush. And this idea of the Memex really sticks with him. And, and years later, Douglas Engelbart is kind of trying to figure out what to do with his life. You know, he could settle down, have a family, all that, but he really wants to make the world a better place. And, and he realizes the computers could be the way to do this. The computers could be a way to create something like the Memex. And he, he dedicates himself to this. And on December 9th, 1968, he demos what he's been working on. He does this demo in, in San Francisco. And for this demo, he has managed to create hypertext. He has managed to create a collaborative working environment on a screen using, you know, pointing software. And also, for this demo, he invented the mouse. We have a pointing device called a mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. That'll show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrew's hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. 
I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. So this was absolutely groundbreaking, and definitely an influence on Tim Berners-Lee. And at this point, 1968, we kind of, we've kind of entered the, the time cone of those 30 years before the World Wide Web, which is good, because this is the point where I want to branch off, where I want to kind of turn things around and look the other way. Because you saw there that there was this live link-up during the mother of all demos, as it's called. There was this live link-up between San Francisco and Menlo Park. And there's a question that nobody is asking, but I'm going to answer it anyway. And that question is, who's operating the camera in Menlo Park? Well, the person on the other side of the camera in Menlo Park is this guy. And his name is Stuart Brand. Now, Stuart Brand has spent the 60s doing what most people in the 60s were doing. He was dropping acid, you know, it was all legal back then. Uh, he was on the Merry Pranksters bus with Ken Kesey. You know, on one particular acid trip, he described how he could see the horizon curving before him, really realizing that we're all on one planet. And he started this campaign with these badges. Uh, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet, right? Like, I like that the yet kind of gives it this uh, conspiracy theory feel. Um, this was before we did have a picture from space of the whole Earth, and uh, he was onto something here. He did realize that it could be a consciousness-changing thing for us to see that we're all on the same planet, we're all part of the same species, just as LSD is a consciousness-changing thing. And then we did get a photograph of the whole Earth. We got pictures like Earthrise from Apollo 8, and Stuart Brand used these pictures of the whole Earth when he published the Whole Earth Catalog, 1968. Now, this was a series of books. They were kind of like Wikipedia before there was the internet, right? The idea was, oh, let's say you're running a commune or living on a commune. You need, you need to know about agriculture and the weather and technology and all kinds of stuff. Well, what you need is the Whole Earth Catalog. Um, it was very influential. You know, he uh, in some ways influenced the the environmental movement to a great degree. Uh, he wrote a lot as well. Um, like, for example, in, in I think it was 1972, he wrote this great piece in uh, Rolling Stone magazine about Space War, which was one of the first uh, games that were played on, played on a screen with computers. And he began to see that computers were really something. Computers were maybe what were going to change the world. In fact, he said at one point, computers are the new LSD. Now, years later, he published something in a completely different area, which was architecture. He wrote this book called How Buildings Learn, uh, a classic book. I would uh, define a classic book as a book where uh, lots of people have heard of it and nobody's read it. Um, and in this book, he talks about the work of a British architect named Frank Duffy and a particular concept that Frank Duffy has coined called shearing layers. And the way that Duffy describes this idea of shearing layers as this. He says that a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity. You've got these like layers with different rates of change. And he diagrammed this out for like a typical building, you know. Um, you've got the site that the building is situated on and there. You're talking about a time scale that's geological, right? Uh, and then you've got the structure that hopefully won't change for hundreds of years. And then you'd start to get into infrastructure, right? The skin inside. And you'd probably swap that out every couple of decades. And you go right down until you're at the layer of moving furniture around inside a room, which, you know, can happen every day. So there's these different timescales, different rates of change. And what I kind of like as well about this diagram and this idea is the way that each layer depends on the layer below, but right? you can't have a structure for a building until you've got a site to put that structure on. So anyway, Stuart Brand, he's written this book, he's talking about architecture, and he goes on to do a whole bunch of other things. Like he, he forms the Long Now Foundation, along with uh, Danny Hillist, computer scientist, and Brian Eno, the musician and producer. Um, and this is an organization dedicated to long-term thinking. I count myself a member of the Long Now Foundation. This is my membership card, which is, of course, made from a durable material because we're talking about long-term thinking here. Like, if you go on the website for longnow.org, you'll see that any time they reference a year, they use five digits instead of four. They all the, the years begin with a trailing zero, um, you know, to solve the Y10K problem. And they have all these projects to do with encouraging long-term thinking. And the, probably the most famous project is the clock of the long now. And the idea here is that this is a clock that will tell the time for 10,000 years. And, you know, Brian, Eno, Brian Eno's written this 
a generative chime series for it. It'll chime once a century and so on. This is a scale model of the clock of the long now that you can find in the Science Museum in London, along with half of Charles Babbage's brain and the original Next Machine that the World Wide Web was created on. But this is just a scale model, a small scale model. Uh, the real clock will be quite huge. It'll be inside a mountain in West Texas. And construction is underway. It's going well. And I hope to visit the clock of the long now someday. And Stuart Brand has written about the ideas because it's a fascinating kind of uh, design challenge, how you build something that will still be understandable in 10,000 years. It's almost like the, the Voyager record, right? How do you communicate without um, symbols, without, without language? Um, but he published this book where he gathered together a lot of his thoughts. Uh, in the year 2000, he published this book called The Clock of the Long Now. The full title is The Clock of the Long Now, Time and Responsibility, The Ideas Behind the World's Slowest Computer. And in this book, he takes the idea of shearing layers from architecture and he abstracts that idea out into something more general called pace layers. So what if it's not just buildings? What if any kind of system can be thought of as different layers of rates of change? And he diagrams this out uh, for one system, which is just the human species. So in our species, for example, he says there's our fundamental nature and that hasn't changed for you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of years, you know, what makes us human? You know, physiologically, there isn't any difference between a caveman and an astronaut, right? So that changes really slowly. And then above that, you've got culture, which also changes slowly, but we're talking about, you know, centuries here. Um, you know, the, how we create tribes, how we identify ourselves into countries, uh, languages, things like that. Then there's governance, uh, which is systems of governance, not governments, but the systems that we, we run societies with, like you know, a feudal system or a monarchy or representational democracy. And these do change over time, uh, but they tend to be you know, slow change. And then you've got the infrastructure that we need for day-to-day for -day life, um, which needs to change faster, uh, but not too fast. And finally, you get into commerce, which is like, okay, now we're, now we're moving at a faster pace again. But fastest of all at the top is what he calls fashion. And by fashion, he means anything that moves quickly. This could be, you know, pop music. This could be anything that's supposed to not stand still. It would be really boring if fashion and pop music stood still and moved slowly. The whole idea of something at this layer of fashion is to try stuff out. You know, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. What about this? What about that? Try that. No, try that. Okay, and the really good stuff, the stuff that does stick to the wall, maybe you'll find its way down into the longer lasting layers. So like a really good pop song could become part of culture. So here's, here's what Stuart Brand says about this idea of pace layers and the difference between these, these rates of change. He says, fast learns, slow remembers. Fast proposes and slow disposes. Fast is discontinuous, and slow is continuous. And fast and small instructs slow and big uh, by accrued innovation and by occasional revolution. Slow and big controls fast and small by constraint and constancy. And he says, fast gets all the attention, but slow has all the power. Now, Personally, once I was exposed to this idea of pace layers, I just started seeing it everywhere, right? It's become like a joke in the clear left office, you know, time to pace layers. How long before somebody makes a pace layer comparison? Like, do you remember, I'm showing my age, but years ago we had this book uh, by Jesse James Garrett, The Elements of User Experience, and it had this diagram in it, which is literally showing the different elements of user experience, uh, going from the, the abstract strategy to the more concrete interface uh, of a piece of software. And I just took one look at this and was like, oh, pace layers. This is... This can be mapped to pace layers. It's different rates of change. So I was wondering if, if, if so many things can be mapped to this idea of pace layers, could I take the World Wide Web and map it to pace layers? So I think at the bottom layer, you've got the internet itself, right? Uh, the transmission control protocol and internet protocol. That's all it cares about is switching packets around, created by Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf back in the 1970s and pretty much unchanged since. And it feels right that that lowest layer is, is unchanging. We wouldn't want that to be changing much. Now then on top of that, we are free to build 
application-specific protocols, like the hypertext transfer protocol, which also, you know, doesn't change very often. Now, it has changed. We now have HTTP2, but the change has been slow and gradual. And again, that feels correct, that this kind of thing shouldn't change too quickly. So what do we put uh, over HTTP? We put URLs uh, on the web. Now, I would love it if URLs we're at the lowest unchanging layer, like URLs. Once the URL is up there, it's unchanging forever. I wish that were the case. Sadly, it's not. You have to actually really fight to keep a URL online for a length of time. You know, the default state is for, for bit rot and, and URLs to disappear. But we could still, you know, strive to make our URLs long lasting. And what do we put at those URLs? At the simplest level, because this is the web, HTML. Right? We, we publish pages that at least consist of HTML, and HTML has changed over time. You know, at the beginning, there was maybe 20 elements in HTML, and now there's like 120 elements in HTML. Um, but the rate of change hasn't been so fast that it's been overwhelming. It's been able to, to keep up. And we got CSS along the way, which I feel like that moves faster than HTML. I feel like we get more new CSS uh, faster than we get new HTML. Um, which feels right as well, because it's you know where we express ourselves so much. But I feel like still like I'm on I'm on top of it. You know we've got Grid and Flexbox and all this great stuff now. But I feel like I can keep up with the rate of change. And then there's the JavaScript ecosystem, and I specifically say the JavaScript ecosystem as opposed to the JavaScript language, because the language itself evolves at a pretty nice pace. But the ecosystem, which is the frameworks and the libraries and the build tools, the best practices, the transpilers, that just seems like it's constant. Like every day, every week, there's, there's, there's a new library, there's a new way of doing things, there's, there's so much new, new, new with JavaScript. And this I do find very overwhelming, I have to say. I find it so hard to keep up with this. But I realized after mapping these things out to pace layers that I could see, oh, wait a minute. JavaScript is kind of supposed to be overwhelming. JavaScript is the, is the fashion part. It's the bit that's up there at the top trying out all the new things. And not everything sticks, right? The whole point is it's like, what about this? Try this. Try this other thing. It's kind of meant to be overwhelming. And the good stuff does stick around and find its way down into the lower layers of the stack, right? So if I think back to the earliest uses of JavaScript back in the 90s, it would have been stuff like image rollovers or um, form validation. You know, is this required field actually been filled in? And these days, you wouldn't even need to use JavaScript to do either of those things because for rollovers, you can use colon hover and CSS. And for form validation, you can use the required attribute in HTML, right? So they've, these things move down into the more longer lasting stack. So. I don't feel so bad about being overwhelmed by all the JavaScript, the constantly changing JavaScript ecosystem, because I feel like it's kind of its job to be overwhelming. It's where change and iteration happens quickly. But here's what's interesting after I mapped out this, this stack of the web technologies into these pace layers was I realized how well it also maps to my own mental model of how I approach building on the web. I mean, I can pretty much assume the presence of the internet, TCP, IP, and HTTP, HTTP, but then I do like to start thinking about URLs first before I even think about anything else. And I think it makes sense to think about the structure of what you're putting online, the HTML, uh, as the next step before then moving on to the presentation, thinking about the CSS, and then finally adding enough JavaScript as necessary. Right when, when you need to add something that HTML and CSS can't do, that's when I reach for JavaScript. So this, this layered approach uh, maps very much to how I personally approach building on the web. But it is a testament to the flexibility of the World Wide Web that you don't have to build that way. If you don't want to build in this, in this layered approach, you don't have to. You could build like this, where, yes, it's on the web, it's on the internet, uh, but you just decide to use JavaScript for everything, because you can do that. I mean, if you want to do URL routing in JavaScript, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Uh, if you want to generate the entire DOM in JavaScript, yeah, rather than use HTML, sure. If you want CSS in JS, yeah, absolutely, that's that's the thing. I mean, this is pretty much the architecture of most single-page apps, right? They assume the presence of the internet and then 
take over and instead of using what the browser gives you, just do everything in JavaScript. You get that much more control. Now, personally, I don't like building this way because kind of what it does is it sets up the web as being uh, something that either doesn't work at all or works great, right? So it's on the web, we need HTTP, and as long as the JavaScript is executed flawlessly, everything's great. But those are your only two options, right? It becomes this binary proposition between something not working at all and working great. Those are your only two options. Now I'll point out that in another medium, this makes complete sense. Like if you're building a native app, let's say you're building a native iOS app. Uh, you build a native iOS app and I've got a iOS device, it works great. I get 100% of what you've designed and built. But if you're building an iOS app and I have an Android device, it doesn't work at all. I get 0% of what you've designed and built. So this, this binary approach does work in another medium, but that's, that's not the way the web works. So it's not the way the web has to work. On the web, you can build in layers, which means you can go from something that doesn't work to something that just about works, right? With the least viable technology to something that works better than that. It works fine. And then something that works well. And then with all the bells and whistles, yeah, it works great. Now, the idea be here being that regardless of the technology that someone has when they come to the thing that you've built on the web, they'll get something. And maybe they won't get something that works great because, because of their device or their browser or their network. But they'll still get something. It won't be 100% or 0%. Maybe they'll get 90% or 80%. Right? So you end up with something much more resilient, much more adaptable if you build in this layered way. Also, it just maps so nicely to the technology stack that you can, you can start you know, with the fundamentals, say like URLs and then HTML, then CSS, then JavaScript, and you can apply this at, at each level. And I'm not the only person who likes building in layers. Uh, I'm gonna quote from my friend, Ethan Marcotte. He says, quote, I like designing in layers. I love looking at the design of a page, a pattern, whatever, and thinking about how it will change. Uh, if say fonts aren't available or JavaScript doesn't work or someone doesn't see the design as you or I might and is having the page read aloud to them. That's a good point, right? The, the unintended uh, use cases of what you're building. It, there's something I, I talk about a lot when it comes to evaluating technologies, how what we, what we gravitate towards asking is this question, how well does it work, right? You're evaluating a new framework or library or browser API, whatever, and you, you wanna know how well does it work, and that makes sense. But there's a much more important question, I think, that you should ask of any new technology, and that's how well does it fail? In other words, is it going to be a single point of failure? If this thing at some point doesn't work 100%, are you stuck? Or does it fail gracefully? I think the web stack is built, if you build in layers, it, it fails well, right? If something goes wrong with the JavaScript, it's not the end of the world, as long as, you know, your HTML is still available. Or the CSS, maybe not all the CSS you provided is supported by every browser, but that's okay. It's not a single point of failure. And this idea, of, of building in layers and choosing the, the least powerful ones to begin with and only adding on more power as you go, that was something that definitely influenced Tim Berners-Lee because it's a design principle that he has talked about influencing the creation of the World Wide Web. It's a design principle called the principle of least power. It's a bit counterintuitive and it states, choose the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose the least powerful language, right? On the, on the face of it, that doesn't seem to make sense. But the idea here is that the least powerful, the boring technology will tend to be more ubiquitous, more universal and less fragile. And the more uh, powerful a technology, the more danger there is of, of fragility. Um, to bring this to the, the web front end stack, I'm gonna quote another friend of mine, Derek Featherstone. He says, quote, in the web front end stack, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ARIA. If you can solve a problem with a simpler solution lower in the stack, you should. It's less fragile, more foolproof, and just works." End quote. So, I mean, the classic example there, like you mentioned, is ARIA, because the, the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA if you don't have to, right? Instead of a div with an ARIA role of button and event listeners and all this stuff, 
just use a button, use the least powerful technology, let the browser do the work. Now, I do get some pushback on this, this approach because people say, well, what you're talking about here, that will work if you're building something simple, but it's not going to scale. It's not going to scale for something really complex. And everybody likes to think that they're working on something complex, right? Like if you were at a, if you're at a dinner party and someone says, what do you do? And you describe what you do. And they said, oh, okay, that sounds pretty easy. You'd be offended. How dare they? Um, but if you're at a dinner party, someone asks what you do, you describe what you do, and they say, oh, that sounds really hard. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, it is really hard, right? So everyone likes to think what they're working on is very complex. It's usually not as simple as that. We talk about, you know, things being simple, things being complex. The truth is, is most things are in between, right? Most things are somewhere. Nothing's quite that simple and nothing's as complex as we like to think it is either. Um, the way this tends to manifest on the web is we talk about, you know, websites and web apps. You know, one thing's simple, one thing's really complex. Um, and I, I find this kind of ridiculous, this idea that we could divide the entire World Wide Web into two categories, websites and web apps. That just doesn't match the reality to me. What I see is much more of a continuum, where even the simplest website has some kind of interaction on it. And even the most complex web app still has content on it, right? So it's much more of a continuum. I'm not that keen on these, these different terms to describe stuff on the web. It's all just stuff on the web. Uh, mind you, there is a term I do kind of like, which is progressive web app. I don't know if you've come across this term. Um, and even if you've come across this term, there's a difference between, you know, reading it and then understanding it because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Like, what is a progressive web app? If you Google that, you find these articles with answers like, well, it's a Zen-like thing, it's native-like interactions. I know it when I see it, uh, which, which isn't very helpful, right? Um, or even worse, you see misinformation like a progressive web app is a single page app. No, no, it's not, not at all. A progressive web, web app is a website, a website that has been elevated, but has been has used a few specific technologies. So you take any website and you make sure it's running on HTTPS, which most websites should anyway. And you give it a, a web app manifest. This is a, a JSON file that's filled with metadata uh, about how this thing should behave when it's added to the home screen. And then finally, you add a service worker, which is a JavaScript file that kind of gets installed onto the user's device that contains instructions. And it can almost act like a proxy. And, and uh, before a request is even sent over the web, the service worker script can make a decision and say, no, let's look in the cache instead of going to the network. A very, very powerful technology. Kind of Kind of hard to get your head around, but very powerful. I'm not going to go into the code of service workers. I, I ended up writing a whole book uh, called Going Offline that you can get from a book apart about that. Um, it's kind of more interesting, I think, to think about the, uh, the uses, uh, how this service workers uh, can improve the user experience. I have to say, when I first came across service workers, they kind of messed with my head because this was my mental model of the web. I had it nicely categorized into paste layers, and each layer depends on the layer below. And then service workers come along and they say, well, actually you can build a website that works like this, that even when the internet goes away, the website could still work. I mean, I just couldn't grasp this at first. I had to really readjust my worldview. And, and there's different levels of, of what you can do here. So I'll give you an example. Here's a website uh, I created many years ago called huffduffer.com. It's a way of creating a podcast of, of found sounds. And I've added, a. it runs on HTTPS. It's got this web app manifest with metadata and it's got a service worker. Now all the service worker does is that if you're offline or the website is down, um, you see an offline page it just says, you're offline. Sorry about that. Now. Not a very powerful use of service workers. It's almost really just like branding, right? That instead of seeing the browser default offline message, I'm showing you, you know, the Hufta for customized offline message. It's kind of like, you know, the way we do uh, customized 404 pages. Now we can do customized offline pages. Um, but even that can be, can be pretty powerful. Like here's a website for a conference we ran at Clear Left uh, a couple of years back uh, here in Brighton, um, the ampersand conference, all about web typography. And if you're offline or the website was down, 
and you visited the website, you'd still get this offline page. It says, you know, sorry, you're offline. But what it does have is the bare minimum information about the conference, what day it's on and what time it starts, that kind of stuff, right? So you can imagine this for a, a, a restaurant website so that maybe you can't reach the website to place an order or make a reservation, but you could still have an offline page saying, here's the location and here are the hours, right? I mean, I would like it if the online website had that information too. Um, you can have fun with this too. Like Trivago relies on search for a lot, so it's very hard to do that offline. So what they do is they give you a game to play when you're offline to keep you sticking around, right? So if you're offline, you can play the offline maze game until you're back online. So that's a very simple use of service workers to just serve up a custom offline page. On the complete opposite end of the scale, you can make the service worker kind of do almost everything like so here this is a website called resilientwebdesign.com and it's it's a book that's online I, I wrote this book uh it's got a lot of the ideas i've kind of been talking about today um and you go to resilientwebdesign.com and this is how it looks when it's online and this is how it looks when it's offline exactly the same in fact the moment you visit resilientwebdesign.com the entire book gets downloaded onto your device, your laptop, whatever it happens to be. And the next time you visit, it doesn't even go to the network. It just automatically looks at the local cached version. So that whether you're you know, in the subway, in an airplane, under the sea, in a submarine, whatever, you can read this book without relying on the internet connection. Now, that's a pretty extreme case. That is offline first, right? Where you don't even go to the network for anything. Um, most websites, you wouldn't want to do that because you probably want the HTML to be fresh because they, they update quite often. So what I've done on my own website, dactyl.com, is, you know, it's a regular personal website. It's got blog posts and links and stuff like that. Is that if you do try to visit while you're offline, it says, sorry, you're offline. Here's a custom offline page. But it can give you uh, a list of things that you can revisit. These are pages that you've already visited while you were online. So you can say, hey, you're offline, but you can still read these pages. So that's a kind of a, that's a nice pattern to, to offer people. It does have the downside that all I can offer you is stuff that you've already visited, right? Uh, another pattern that I think is maybe more powerful for the end users is to put the control in the user's hands. So here's a website called archive.deconstruct.org, and it is an archive, in this case, of conference talks. This is a conference we ran from 2005 to 2015. So that's 10 years of audio from all these conference talks. And what you can do is, as you're browsing around the site, you see that there's the option to save offline that you can toggle or not. Now, if you choose to, to hit that toggle, it's saved onto your device for, for offline. And I don't just mean the page is saved offline, but the audio as well. So then later on, when you're in a submarine or in an airplane or whatever it happens to be where you've got no internet connection, you can listen to all those audio files. I mean, effectively, it's like a podcast player that is also a website. So you see how there's all these different use cases you can use, and it's up to you how far you go, right? So you begin with just having a service worker, and maybe to begin with, you just use it for caching the kind of things you'd be caching anyway, like your JavaScript and your CSS, just improve performance a little bit. And then you go that one step further and you got a custom offline page, same as you'd have a custom 404 page. But then you go further again, you start thinking about how it's going to behave when it's added to the home screen, right? Being much more like a native app. You can go further, you can get push notifications now in web browsers. It used to be if you wanted to make someone's life a misery with push notifications, you had to build a native app. But now we can make people's lives a misery with, uh, with web technology. Or there's really cutting edge stuff like background sync. The idea here being that, you know, somebody can still do actions offline and then uh, those actions can be communicated with the web server when there's an internet connection and the website doesn't even need to be open for this synchronization to take place very powerful technology but not all of these technologies are supported in every browser right i mean service workers they're pretty much universally supported sure and cache stuff yeah fine but you know push notifications you know, spotty support there background sync that's pretty cutting edge so it's not none of these have universal support and that's okay because as long as you're building in a layered way all of these things are kind of extras that you add on top of the core functionality so if there isn't universal support that's fine in fact 
That's the way service workers work. Because you might be thinking, hang on a minute. Earlier on, he was talking about, you know, JavaScript can be a single point of failure with something like a single page app. And that's why I tend to build in a, in a layered way. And yet here we are talking about service workers, which is JavaScript, right? So surely it's a single point of failure. Well, no, this is different because you literally can't make a website that relies on a service worker. Think about it. The first time someone comes to the website, even if their browser supports service workers, the service worker can't be installed yet. It hasn't been installed. So you have to make something that works first without a service worker and then add the service worker functionality, whatever it is, add that as an enhancement on top. So you kind of have to build in a layered way to use service workers, which is, I think, why they appeal to me so much, because they have this, this philosophy of building in a layered way, much like the web itself. So you can literally take any website, whether it's you know an archive of conference material or a personal website or a book, whatever it happens to be, any of these websites can be turned into apps, effectively progressive web apps that can behave just like native apps when they're launched from the home screen. Very powerful stuff. And yet, every one of these sites could still be visited with the very first web browser ever made. That's quite something. Something built, you know, 30 years later can still work in the first website, first web browser ever made. I mean, that's so unusual in the world of technology. If you took a, a word processing file made today and you tried to open it in a 30 year old word processor, you, good luck with that. And yet the web has this unbroken line. Even more amazingly, I think, you could take the very first web page ever published, and here's how it looks in the very first web browser. It's still available at its original URL, but you can open that in a modern web browser, and it still works. We've managed to evolve the web and add all of these technologies, CSS, JavaScript, service workers, all kinds of fantastic additions, and yet we've maintained this backwards compatibility. Now, 30 years isn't exactly the long now, but in terms of technology, it really is quite something. So I think it behooves us to think in this way, like the web itself, to think in a more long-term way, build with resilience in mind, and use the layers of the web. Thank you.